specific goal to make it a learning concert, not only for our students, but also for the uh, audience. So you'll get a little glimpse, a little behind the scenes of what we do, stylistic choices that we make, uh, vocal technique choices that we make, uh, any areas of music history that we might have discussed. So we don't mean to, to give you a lecture, and we'll try to let the uh, important thing be the, the students that you've come to see, but uh, it's kind of fun to get a glimpse behind what we actually do in the choral rehearsal. Now, the first piece that you'll hear is Ritmo by Dan Davison. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I programmed a foreign language piece, so this is in Spanish, and uh, it's a, also a piece that's a, a modern choral concert repertoire, so that kind of checked both of those boxes for me in doing a Music of Our Times concert. Uh, Dan Davison is a living composer, again, another must for me for a Music of Our Times concert, uh, so, uh, so that's a, a great uh, thing also, and a uh, choral music educator himself, like me, so uh, has quite a bit of body percussion, claps and snaps, uh, marching and chest pounds. Uh, so that'll be a fun challenge for us uh, as well and a new experience, kind of a new feature of modern choral music uh, as well. So uh, uh, yeah, it uh, features our two great WIU accompanists, Guangwan and Po, playing a very exciting forehand piano part. So excited to have them joining us as well. So we hope that you uh, enjoy our concert and starting with Ritmo. Thank you. 
all that clapping without rushing. Nice job, you guys. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> a little contrast to that. So again, when choosing a music uh, for a concert for 20th century or modern era, we have to have some jazz, right? Uh, so that was one that I definitely had to have in my set. So But Beautiful is a jazz standard sung by many of the great jazz vocalists. Uh, Bing Crosby, I think, was the first. Frank Sinatra, Billie Holiday, Nat King Cole. So uh, recently actually revived by uh, Tony Bennett and Lady Gaga, which if you haven't he heard that duets album, it's actually pretty nice. She does a little, little jazz. Uh, this arrangement is by Steve Zagree. Uh, if you have done any vocal jazz in your life, you've most likely sung a Steve Zagree arrangement. He's the godfather of vocal jazz education. Uh, so as a large choir, uh, it's a little more difficult for us to sing jazz, but we worked a lot to find the contrast between our, you know, ritmo, bel canto style of singing uh, and uh, the vocal jazz style, both in uh, vocal production and in uh, style, musical style. So, uh, you know, the human voice is so versatile of an instrument. So I thought that I would take a little bit of a second and show you this contrast from where we went. So uh, first choir, we're going to start at the very beginning, uh, just to give you a little glimpse before we sing the whole thing. Uh, we're going to sing the opening line for you with what would be the bel canto vocal style with vibrato, lots of richness. It'll sound great, uh, but maybe not, you know, the most appropriate for a jazz setting. So uh, students, if you could start at the beginning and sing for me with your longest classical phrase, uh, the very opening of But Beautiful. Uh, is making it a little more conversational, both in speech uh, you know, and singing, making it a little more speech-like, and also the rubato of a, of a jazz ballad uh, would be much less of that arch that you might have in the classical period. So students, let's just start right on that entrance of that phrase, uh, and let's do that with a little bit more of the jazz feel, okay? sound, yeah. So uh, we worked on that, listened to some recordings of all of those great jazz singers, and uh, I think they really learned how to you know, sing some jazz in a large concert setting. So here is the whole of But Beautiful.
And now for something totally different, a little Ives. Uh, so uh, probably the most famous insurance salesman in music history. Uh, so uh, did not make his living uh, with his Yale music degree, uh, but uh, you know, definitely a, uh, a highlight of uh, our semester here and of, uh, I think, of him as being the transition from romantic to modern era, so the mu into the music of our time. Uh, you know, but turn of the century, New England. Uh, his dad was an army band leader, so you can hear that in circus band for sure. Uh, so Ives blended American popular music, existing melodies, marches, ragtime, even a little barbershop at times, with new compositional techniques and off-kilter off tonal moves, uh, tonal clusters, which you'll hear a little bit of that, uh, you know, a little less uh, obvious in some of his choral music, but this is a nice piece to get the uh, students to experience Ives in, in an approachable way. Uh, you'll hear polyrhythms and polytonality uh, just a little bit, uh, but definitely it always goes back to that roots of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the time period, uh, which is such a, such a key point of Ives. Uh, he wrote Circus Band originally while he was at Yale, which is very interesting. So, um, and uh, you know, there's a whole lot of music out there uh, for choral, uh, but, uh, but more for uh, vocal music, which if you are interested, uh, one of our professors, uh, Ricky Sepulveda, is doing his dissertation on Ives, so I'm sure he would love to tell you a lot about Ives, because he knows he's the expert right now. So. Uh, we're going to demonstrate just a couple of these melodies that you're going to hear, so you can hear how he wove in both the music of the time and all these little off-kilter rhythmic and tonal moves. So students, if you could just sing these three melodies, we'll demonstrate it for the audience before they hear it all together. So let's start at square one. Participation of this circus band coming into town. Uh, do the second melody for them, which you're going to hear. Here's Portrait of Magic. <laughs> Just a little bit rhythmically, not quite what you expect, but so there he sees the parade going by. And then the third one, uh, he sees the lady in pink, uh, which he's so excited. He remembers her from last time and doesn't quite see her at first this time. Very nice choir. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit of each of the kind of features of those melodies, plus a couple other ones even layered on top, and how at the end of the song, all of that comes into this cacophony of what might be a circus uh, in Ives' March version. I'll also tell you a little bit about our last song, which is Prepare, uh, which we are going to go straight into. Uh, so we're not going to take a, uh, a break there. Uh, so Prepare is a modern gospel rendition by Michael Englehart, uh, who actually uh, taught at Millican, went to Millican for a while. So he's actually a new composer, just a couple years older than me. Uh, and uh, so uh, it's great to get, for a Music of Our Time concert, somebody from a, a, a local uh, new composer. Uh, and so we worked quite a bit to adapt our style to make it brassier, brighter for that modern gospel uh, trend. Uh, trend. Uh, you know, it's a crucial part of that also as a combo that we have here. So some of our great WI instrumentalists will be joining us. Uh, you know, the modern gospel movement is, is big in churches, but also in schools all over the country and the world. So I had to include some sort of modern gospel uh, for our Music of Our Time concert. So uh, this is Circus Band uh, going into Prepare. Hope that you enjoy both. And uh, this is Concert Choir.
So every semester, spring semester at this time, we try to do a study, and that's kind of Jason talked to you a little bit about what they were doing uh, with uh, concert choir, and we also did the same study with university singers. So we'll s switch gears uh, just a little bit. Uh, most of the time, as you guys know, in rehearsal, we're busy working for our next concert. It's nice to take a little bit of time and spend more time talking about our music and looking at specific aspects. I love the 20 and 20th and 21st century. That is the music of our time. It's a beautiful time, really only defined by the calendar because there's so many styles, many of them influenced by the earlier styles, such as the Renaissance, the Baroque, the classical and romantic. May I say that this evening for our portion of the concert, you'll hear a little bit of all of that in my selections, plus some new things. So everything you hear, this is not exhaustive, this is just enough that we can offer to you tonight in our time frame. but we've tried to find unique pieces that you'll find very interesting. Uh, I want to say also hello uh, to everyone out in the audience. I know my dear friend, Dr. Greg Gentry from the University of Colorado is watching tonight, and I hope he really is. He went skiing today in Colorado. What a rough life, right? Okay. <laughs> so anyway, it was nice to talk to him before he, uh, uh, I had to uh, come on in this evening. So we're going to start with the music of Benjamin Britten, okay? Uh, the selection that we're going to do, our opening number, is from his five flower songs. It's number two. Let me get my note. This particular song was composed for the 25th wedding anniversary of friends of uh, Benjamin Britten. They were botanists, amateur botanists, and they were also supporters of the foundation that produced his operas, so he was happy to write these beautiful pieces. Each of the five flower songs is about some flower. This one, of course, called The Succession of the Four Sweet Months, talks about the succession of uh, are different months that lead up to the beautiful flowers of summertime, particularly the wildflowers, which are really quite beautiful in July around here in Western Illinois, my favorite time of year for looking at wild, wildflowers. So rather than talk to you about the text, we're going to introduce you to this music. Now let me tell you right now, what we're going to perform for you is modeled after a Renaissance motet. The only thing that's different, and may I say a Renaissance polyphonic motet, which means a multi-voiced song. So what's different is we all have a similar melody, but every voice part has a different part of the text. And of course, that's a real departure from the Renaissance. Let's, uh, let me do a little demonstration for you. And I want you to listen closely at each group that sings their words. Don't, aren't quite the same, are they? Now the tenors will come in with their verse.
presented individually. We're going to give you, since it's such a short piece, we're going to give you a chance to hear it two ways. One with a small chamber ensemble, our madrigal singers, back from fall, our fall madrigal singers that are all in this group, and then we'll perform it for you with the full choir. Madrigal singers, would you come on down and sing it for us, please? Options of choosing the size of ensembles that we get to use with some of this modern music of our time. Now we'll change the character of this piece by performing it for you with the full choir. And you'll notice the change in the expression and the communication as well.
next piece we're about to perform for you is one of my favorite uh, on the program, the Ubi Caritas uh, by Ole Yeho. The text rejoices in God with his gift of love and charity, that famous text. This is actually one of Ola's first pieces that he ever wrote. You'll be interesting, interested to note that he's affected very much by music of the cinema, music uh, scores that you would see in film, and he actually studied a uh, film score uh, out in California and did a wonderful job at that, and you hear those sounds in his music. This Ubi Caritas, there's a fa very famous uh, version of this written by Durafle that actually uses the plain chant, the Gregorian plain chant, Ubi Caritas. We have a similar sounding chant from Ola, however, it's uh, an original composition. And here's what's cool. When this was first written, it was scored for an unaccompanied choir, and later he went in and scored, are you ready for this? a piano part with a new age sound. As I told my choir, I never thought I must be old and losing it and it's a good thing that I'm gonna retire. I never thought I would stand up here and love conducting a piece with a new age accompaniment on the piano. So I've come a long way. And anyway, we're gonna demonstrate a little bit. Let's listen to that original chant melody and let you hear how it kind of goes together before we perform it for you. a little bit of uh, the piano part played by Poe. Go ahead, Poe, and let him hear a little bit of it. So see, we have now music from the 21st century, but I'm looking to older styles to help me perform the Renaissance of the chant that you heard. The Romantic style, because you'll hear the ebb and flow of the phrases that we'll sing as the piece progresses. Additionally, we have something very new and independent and free that's interpolated, and it's, uh, I think, quite stunning. I hope you enjoy this performance.
Sometimes you have music that defines a new style, comes along every now and then, and we can attribute that to Eric Whitaker, the next piece we're about to do, Luke's Arumque. You'll notice the choir is changing positions because we feel like we came in here on Thursday and kind of tuned each piece to the hall so we could get the most sound out of the choir. That's half our battle, and it's a wonderful acoustical environment which which to experiment with those sounds, okay? Uh, anyway, here's what's interesting. This is unusual, okay? So technique sometimes it o goes over art. What I mean is Eric Whitaker took an English text, okay, and he, light and gold, and he converted it into a Latin text. He had someone do that for him because he prefers the sounds, the atmosphere that is created by the sounds that we make as a choir. I hope you really enjoy the sounds that we bring out to you. One of the things I found, find fascinating about this Christmas piece is the fact that actually some of the dissonances that we're used to hearing in the older styles now come across as glistening consonances. So you'll hear us paint uh, different sounds, okay? What we're trying to do for you is paint the image of angels singing to the baby Christ child. So we hope that you hear, and Eric says this in his notes, is the fact that the feeling, the atmosphere, the emotion, is more important than the text themselves. We've kind of seen an abandonment of the meaning of text, sometimes like in the music of uh, whatever his name is that wrote uh, the Symphony of Psalms. Can anyone say who that is? Thank you, Igor Stravinsky. Can you tell I just got back from a choral festival? All righty, here we go. So thank you whoever saved me, I really appreciate that, okay? Anyway, everything, there's a higher calling than the text. Can I just show you the sounds that you ought to listen for? The first one is what I term the light chord. Okay, so this will glimmer and show light. section and you can hear it clearly. It's pure, which means pure. Listen now to the pure tones the choir sings. And then next, I love what he does with taking, he, he changes the voices, and he's very expressive using different registers of the voice. And the final thing about the nativity, the birth itself, natum, the Latin word for that, I want you to listen to how this kind of resonates by the fact that we're in such low range for this piece. So here we go. So now you have a little listening guide, and you can hear this. He, he, I really feel that Eric started this new craze of atmosphere music that we hear from composers now all of the time. And it's a wonderful approach to spirituality, I think.
So, let me ask you that. Did you like that piece? Did you, you really, you liked it? Would you like to hear it one more way? Just gives you a different sound experience. Are you interested in that? Okay, we'll do it then. Concert choir, our guests that are sitting on the side aisles, could everyone please move to the center section and you'll get an enhanced experience, okay? Here we go, could y'all move quickly? University singers, when they're out of the way, let's move on down, okay?
Chichester Psalms. You may not have ever heard psalms sung this way. Very aggressively and quite interesting if you ask me. In fact, a concert choir, this will be the piece you'll be preparing pretty soon. You'll be joining us in the orchestra for our April Masterworks concert. And that'll be my last one ever here and I get to conduct. And I'm scared to death because the score is very hard, okay? And I don't read music, so it's, I have to move it that way. <laughs> all right? It's, it's a rough gig, all right? What I love about this piece is everyone probably knows that, in my estimation, one of the greatest American musicians was Leonard Bernstein. He could compose. He could conduct. And he was a television personality when they first started TV, and he took advantage of that, he was quite the personality. He took a sabbatical from his work with the New York Philharmonic, and he was commissioned by the Reverend Walter Husey uh, in, at the Chichester Cathedral in England to write a work for their festival there, the Chichester Festival in the Chichester, Chichester excuse me, Cathedral. And may I say, he was pretty bold and daring. All the things that we are talking about now in equal rights and freedom and the fact that we help people, Leonard Bernstein was working on that a long time ago. So here is a Christian cathedral and he writes a piece for them in Hebrew. Eyes were raised, but it was very wonderfully well received. So he had a problem. He had to write this piece of score very quickly while he was on sabbatical and he was running out of time. So what music do we start here? Well, we hear little glimpses of West Side Story and some other things that he has done in this music which makes it absolutely wonderful. So now, for the first time, we're seeing choral music and orchestral music that is influenced by the theater. First time it's ever happened. I think it's wonderful and I hope you enjoy what br we bring to you today, okay? We're going to sing a little bit of it so you can, it'll set you up for what we're doing, okay? The opening is quite unusual. It's Psalm 108, so this first movement is the combination of two different Psalms, 108 and Psalm 100. You all are probably somewhat familiar with Psalm 108, Awake, Psaltery, and Harp. Let's hear what that sounds like. It's about joy. Sing unto the Lord a new song, right? Let's listen to how Leonard Bernstein, now we actually get to sing in this wonderful asymmetrical meter called 7-4. Okay, I've been practicing that a whole lot. Floor, window, ceiling. And it's the window and ceiling part that changes its time. Here we go. I hope you enjoy this joyous setting. Sing this piece. 
buttons because you really get to blow and go. Okay, that's our favorite style. Now next, we're going to try, uh, uh, we're now about to, according to the Psalms, enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Woo, you're going to hear the thanksgiving. Okay, but it's not the way you want to hear it. In fact, it's a little odd. It almost sounds pagan. So we have this, this, this pull of good and evil going on underneath this wonderful, joyous text. Here we go.
American jazz. It's on the scene. It's been around a long time. And guess what? It has now come to the medium of choral music. Uh, so George Shearing, the composer, was actually a British-born composer, but he moved to the United States and made most of his living here in the United States. What I love about George Shearing, I've had the opportunity to premiere when I sang with the Houston Concert Chorale some of his works originally written for chorus and a jazz uh, ensemble. Uh, so we're going to do one of his later works, which was uh, written for a group up in St. Charles, Illinois, believe it or not. It's from the work Songs and Sonnets, and we're doing one, It Was a Lover in Its Last, set to the Shakes, famous Shakespeare text. Now here's what I'd like you to notice. He is not asking the choir to sing jazz style. He wants us to sing our classical sounds, our classical vowels and modifying them appropriately for this piece, which makes a real uh, interesting combination. Uh, let us demonstrate a little bit of it for you. wonderfully well. The voice leading is absolutely superb. I love this piece. I love the whole collection. Let's give you another listen. Did you notice how square we were, square classical musicians? Now we're going to change that. I'm going to invite the vocal jazz ensemble to come down here, and they're going to perform it. This time Poe's going to uh, play with the piano for us. Come on down, guys. Okay, and uh, we're going to let you hear a little bit of it with what we would do if we were regular jazz style singers, swinging the rhythms and uh, having a little bit more liberty with this. And let's see what it sounds like, okay? I'd like to welcome uh, Aaron Krings as our bass player uh, this evening. So fortunate uh, to have him join us. We've played together before on another piece by George Shearing, I believe, just a couple of years ago. Guys, thanks for coming out on this beautiful day and listening to us talk. We kept it as short as possible. Did you notice my note card so I wouldn't ramble off on the other stuff? We just gave you need-to-know information. Thank you for participating in our study. I hope you enjoy your evening, safe travels, and good night. <laughs>